The first question is, didn't Solomon basically become a Satanist after he was saved? And I think this was uh, basically a follow-up uh, based on a question I think we had last week. It was about what happens if a Christian um, becomes a Satanist. Doesn't that prove disprove eternal security? If that's a possibility, doesn't that disprove uh, eternal security? I think we did a good job of refuting that. And so I think this is a follow-up question. Again, didn't Solomon basically basically become a Satanist after he was saved? Well, I'd like I'll answer that, uh, but I just want to remind you that Paul said to the church that when they go to the with their friends and do as the other Gentiles do and sacrifice things to idols, they sacrifice them to devils, and that they he would have them not fellowship with devils, so. It's possible to be saved and yet do something that honors Satan. I believe it's also possible uh, to think you're worshiping God and you're not. So what happened with Solomon is, and this is what blows my mind, you guys. God appeared to him not once, but twice. The Lord appeared to him, and I believe this was a pre-incarnate Christ a Christophany, a pre-incarnate Jesus that appeared to Solomon warning him not to allow women to take his heart away from him. So what happened is Solomon had hundreds of wives, over a thousand concubines, right? And he married foreign women, including the Pharaoh's daughter. And they worshipped false gods. They worshipped literal devils. It says that the things that Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. They think they're sacrificing to some little G God, but it's devils they sacrifice to. So his wives wanted to worship their gods, right? So what happened is Solomon built them high places and it tells you that he built certain high places for like the abomination of moab and the these like uh chemosh and uh uh molech these child sacrificial demons where people would literally throw their babies alive to burn alive on these metal idols it was disgusting it was terrible the word Gehenna actually comes from this forbidden place where they would burn their children alive, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom or Gehenna. And that is referencing the trash heap outside Jerusalem, Gehenna. It's a horrid place where judgment will come because of these wicked things. So in that sense, yes, he left the true God through his women. He allowed his women to worship other gods and as the leader of the nation of israel he was not to worship any other god but the true god as the leader the head of god's people set up on the throne of david he was supposed to preserve god in the worship of the true god of israel and was supposed to not allow the Israelites to do this. But because of his love or lust or whatever for these women that he married, he allowed literal devil worship. So in the sense, in his last days, you can see if you read scripture, he seems very depressed. All is vanity. He had all the money in the world. He had all the women he wanted. He had all the power. He had all the wisdom all is vanity it was like he, he realized no matter what you get in this world if you don't have fellowship with god and you it, it, it's all for nothing like it, it everything the lord is everything and so i think he saw the emptiness that he felt and i think he suffered emptiness but it doesn't mean he wasn't a man of god uh I would find it very hard to believe that since God knew the end from the beginning, 
that he would allow Solomon to build his temple, told David he had too much blood on his hands, but he said Solomon would build it, to build his temple, have a relationship with Solomon, warning him not to do exactly what he did, and that he was somehow lost. I do not believe Solomon was lost. I believe he was saved. He was God's child. He messed up big time. He went off and, and did exactly what God told him not to. But I do not believe God forsook him. I believe he always knew who the one true God was. He always worshiped the one true God, but he was disobedient in this area. And yes, literally allowed his wives to worship devils, set up high places for these false gods. So in that sense, yes, he did. Did he lose salvation? Absolutely not. And this was even before the Holy Spirit dwelled within us. I believe God preserves his people. I think Solomon suffered some on this earth. You can see his depression and, and desperation in some of his writings. He seems very, very down. Um, and I, I think he he brought some kind of um, uh, future damages and consequences on his throne because of his disobedience. Like his sons would follow and they would get worse and worse and worse. And God kept the promise of the throne being in the line of David for his father's sake. But you'll see that his uh, behavior... I believe it carries on down the line through his own children. And there were consequences later on, even after his life. So his legacy was destroyed and there were consequences temporally here on earth. And I believe that he will answer for it before the Lord. But surely Solomon was a man of God. He wrote parts of the Bible. Uh, I believe he was absolutely saved. There's nothing to suggest otherwise, regardless of how far he went into disobedience. Okay. Amen. All right. Uh, Brother Ben, uh, you're right that uh, that was a follow up to the question last week about uh, if a person, if a believer becomes a Satanist, uh, do, do they lose their salvation or does it prove they never really got saved? So this is a very good uh, uh, follow up to, to cite this as an example. Brother Ben? Well, I agree with Renee 100%. Um, in fact, um, well, first of all, you know, again, Solomon wrote Proverbs. That's a big book. Ecclesiastes. That's got a lot of verses. Song of Solomon. Uh, so I, I find it extremely difficult to believe that God is, it intends us to believe that Solomon wasn't saved, that he would use an unsaved man to uh, uh, author his word. I, I find that extremely difficult. Um, but I do believe in some ways, it, when, when, he, when his heart was eventually moved from the Lord, his career not not Solomon himself, but his career does serve as a type in some respects to the man of sin. Uh, for example, and I think scripture drops hints about that because, for example, it says uh, he he uh, get, he you know six hundred sixty six talents of gold were uh, delivered to him for the temple. Um, he had all these uh, a harem of a thousand women. And I think there's somewhere else in the scripture, I can't remember the verse, that the man of sin, essentially, uh, in the Old Testament, that he uh, he will not honor the, de the desire of women. If you go back to Genesis 3, we know what the desire of women is. Uh, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule, rule over you. That's Genesis 3, 16. And so, in that respect, you know, the, the wife desired her husband, and yet, uh, Solomon certainly didn't honor that desire because he had many wives and it says the man of sin also would be that way. And again, the, the correlation 666 and there's some other things too that I found that were just curious that seemed like the, his career uh, at, after he departed from the Lord, his career uh, w had some parallels to uh, some end time events, I believe. Anyhow. The weight of gold. The weight of gold. Yep, yep. yep. Weight of gold. You're right, Ben. That's what that was. Right. 666, right? Yeah, there's something too. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, there's, there, there, yeah, there's a bunch of things I, I came across. I think there, it's a very compelling case, actually. But anyways, um, Renee is absolutely right. Um, you know, I think Scripture is teaching that you know a genuinely a genuinely saved man can have a hard can not should but can 
A genuinely saved person can have a, th a thousand women, a harem of a thousand women. A genuinely saved man can worship false gods. A genuinely saved man can build temples to, of worship to, to, to demon gods, essentially. You know, most Christians probably would denounce, you know, such a possibility of that with like, that's heresy, antinomianism, or that's cheap grace. Uh, I mean, I, I, again, that's leaning on your own understanding. Scripture, I think if you love scripture, uh, that I think we, people underestimate the depravity of the human heart. Even as saved people, we have two natures still. And that old nature isn't any better than it used to be. It, in fact, it grows worse. So um, you're either walking with the Lord or you're walking in the flesh. And if you're walking with the Lord, you're growing in the spirit. You're growing the new man. If you're walking in the flesh, you're growing more corrupt. And uh, sadly, too many believers have a downward trajectory uh, and even to, even if you are uh, you know have an upward trajectory for 30 40 years there's nothing to say that your end of your life or some other time you could s slip up into apostasy and I think Solomon is a textbook case for that and like Brene said that the the scripture is clear that you know he erected uh, temples for Moloch worship which involved human sacrifices uh, which is you know that was strictly prohibited by the Le Le Levitical law uh, Chemosh worship uh, was also, you know, uh, very, um, apparently, uh, very sexually um, uh, licentious. Uh, just, just, you know, just orgies, orgies and worship of false gods and idolatry. Um, absolutely. The, the scripture is replete with examples uh, and warnings to believers not to allow that to happen to yourself. To be, uh, watch out for yourself and to watch out for others. Um but I think I, I, absolutely King Solomon is an example of a believer that basically did become a Satanist. Maybe not uh, worshiping Satan himself, but uh, it, it's no difference. I mean, it, it, he worshiped demons and uh, he he had pleasure in evil. Uh, he, he, he worshiped evil. So um, I think that's a real possibility. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Um, well, good answers by both of you, I think. Uh, well, usually uh, when people bring up an issue uh, and say, well, is this possible? Uh, can a person lose their salvation? Be, you know, or can a uh, person uh, become a Satanist? And these hypothetical situations are, um, they're there to... Uh, uh, some of them are sincere questions that people are curious and want to know. Other times they're there because it's the intention to try to uh, uh, tamper with our faith, make us doubt doubt uh, that, that we can trust the Bible. Um, but uh, it certainly is, should be obvious to everybody that uh, Solomon... Uh, if we look at, he wrote three books. I don't think I'm forgetting one. There weren't four, I don't think. But he got the Song of Solomon, which is more of a love story. Uh, but uh, Proverbs, that's the book we send people to if you want to learn how to live your life and be wise and productive and not foolish. And so it's, it's not really a story of, of people and events. Uh, it, it's a, a series of one or two liners that, that uh, proverb is something that teaches a profound point in only a few words, kind of like the truisms that we are promoting here at CES. Um, so um, I've heard it said that, that Solomon was considered at that time to be the wisest man in the world. And uh, I think even today, uh, many theologians would not hesitate to say he was the wisest man in the world. Uh, and yet, after, and I, I, don't, I didn't look up the dates, but I'm pretty confident that we have, after Proverbs came Ecclesiastes. And uh, so what's Ecclesiastes about? By the way, on my channel, Brother Luke, uh, I did a verse-by-verse -verse teaching on both Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So I hope you'll go through that and uh, see what I think of that uh, one verse at a time. Uh, they're pretty amazing. I Proverbs is just so helpful to help us to live our lives. And Ecclesiastes, it really puts everything in perspective. Uh, but so I think the Ecclesiastes were written at the end of uh, the life of, of uh, Solomon. Uh, so here he is 
the richest man in the world, uh, envied by other kings all over the world for his wealth and his wisdom. Uh, and yet something horrible happened uh, because he got involved with all of these uh, pagan religions and he was not only tolerant of them, but uh, he allowed, he practiced and allowed others to, to practice them freely. And of course, uh, in Judaism, uh, that's one of the things that God tells the Jews not to do. Don't, don't mix with the, the other religions and, and ruin uh, the Judaism, which later transformed it to Christianity. So uh, he's, he's, if he's that wise, and then at the end of his life, he's reflecting, uh, okay, how could I be so wise? And, the, and yet it's no secret, the horrible things I've done, allowing all these pagan religions to be practiced here, and even myself engaging in it, because my wives were from those countries with those religions. And, and uh, maybe, as he said in Proverbs, he said, it's better to live alone in your attic than in a large mansion with a nagging wife. He also said it's better to live in the middle of a wilderness than alone in a mansion with a, a nagging wife. So imagine that if you had one nagging wife, it's bad enough. But if you have hundreds of them, <laughs> oh, man. I mean, uh, people would be envious of him having all those wives. But but really, I don't think uh, it worked out very well for him uh, because uh, he was probably nagged and pressured uh, to uh, allow their religions to, to come into Israel. Uh, so in Ecclesiastes, the, the really the, the main point that he's saying there is, okay, I've reflected on my life, and uh, I've, I've, now I realize that wealth is, is, is just vanity. Vanity means it has no value. It's worthless. Uh, you know, uh, wisdom, uh, uh, of course, wisdom is a knowledge and understanding applied is wisdom. But uh, all the things that he taught, uh, he failed to, to do them himself. So uh, uh, it's a vanity if you don't apply what he taught. Uh, wealth, fame, he said all these things were vanity. His conclusion was there's one thing that is worthwhile in life, and that is uh, a relationship with God, our creator. And so uh, it's, it's beautifully written. If you haven't read Ecclesiastes, I hope everybody will read it today. It's, it's a fantastic book, but I think it's his, his um, repentance. And, and I think he shows great contrition that he had gone astray. Uh, and he compromised basically what he did, I believe, is the first historical indication of what we would call today ecumenicalism. Let me see. I, I looked up the word. It says... Uh, Ecumenicalism is, uh, uh, gosh, this is um, principles and practices, especially as shown among religious groups, such as Christian denominations. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's not what it is. I, I, maybe someone else can find a good definition for ecumenical, ecumenism. But it uh, really just means that you're going to allow other religions uh, to um, be accepted, saying, okay, like, well, there's many ways to get to Jesus. Matter of fact, you know, Larry King, who had a radio and TV show for 40 or 50 years, he just died yesterday. He was Jewish. He never came to faith in Jesus. He had a lot of people on his show for all those years telling him that he has to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. But as far as I know, he never did. But he always asked every religious teacher that came on his program without fail, he would ask them, well, um, you know, you say that, uh, you know, you, you have to believe in Jesus, but what about the people who don't know about Jesus, never heard of him or, or never will, never came to the conclusion that, that accepted and believed in Jesus? What happens to them? They go to hell. And I, I personally saw Billy Graham uh, tiptoe around that, refusing to give a direct answer like, oh, well, I don't know. God will have to decide. God is just, you know, that kind of a giving wiggle room like, well, Maybe there's, and there's many roads to, to God. Uh, and I saw, of course, um, that guy that has that big church, um, Joel, Osteen. Joel Osteen. He did the same thing. He wouldn't stand up for uh, the gospel and Jesus. Robert Schuller, same thing. 
Yeah, I did. I, I did see one person in all of the times that question was asked. I saw one person stand up for the exclusivity of Jesus. Uh, and, and that was, you might be surprised by this because there's a lot of criticism of him. Uh, it was Rick Warren. Oh, I thought Rick, Rick, Rick Arthur did too. I, Rick Warren. I didn't see Rick uh, Mark, MacArthur's answer, but Rick Warren kept told them, look, I, I, look, all I can go by is what the Bible says and what Jesus says. That's what I believe. And that's what I'm going to take. That's going to be my answer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's uh, the kind of language that, you know, a little child can understand. That there is no other way. You must believe in Jesus to get to go to heaven. So um, he stood up for it, but all the others uh, refused to stand for the, the, the need for Jesus, everybody needs Jesus. Um, uh, but ecumenicalism is, uh, you know, it's a big problem today, trying to get all the religions to work together and cooperate and, and basically just say, we're not gonna criticize each other's religions because there's many different roads to, to God. And that's something that uh, I think we have, we see happened with Solomon. And, uh, but he did, I believe, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes is his book of repentance for, for doing that. Okay, Renee or Ben, what more do you want to say? Yeah, um, one thing I wanted to say on the ecumenical thing, you know, when people accuse us and say, oh, so you're saying there's only one that's so exclusive. God is not exclusive. He doesn't, ex uh, he doesn't exclude anyone from coming to him. He's just saying, look, if I give you directions to my house and tell you that's the only road to get to my house, but you say, no, I'm going to go another way and you don't get there. How can you get mad at me because you took a different path? You know, Jesus declared it. And I'm glad Rick Warren said that. Jesus is the one who said it. So either he's a liar or where they say a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. So you have to choose whether you take him at his word or you don't. So uh, you can, he's warned you. You can't go that way. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. You can't get there on your works. And every other religion is works. Religion will not get you to heaven. Jesus Christ gets you to heaven. And people should get this with celebrities. You can't get into an exclusive nightclub. You have to have somebody that you get in there with because of them, because of their merit. You know? So it's amazing to me that people just can't get this. It's just that they don't like Jesus. They don't like, they think uh, in order to be saved, you, you have to live a certain way and they're not willing to give up whatever, but that's not how you're saved anyway. And, and that's the fault of a lot of Christians being wrong on the gospel, you know, given that, uh, given the message a bad name, making it about moral reform rather than a rebirth, uh, by faith. But I want to mention in Solomon there, it's a fascinating, Solomon is a fascinating character in scripture to study. Um, and also there's a lot of legends outside the Bible about Solomon and a lot of the, uh, pagan surrounding nations there. Ethiopia has a lot of them. Uh, I'm told the queen of Sheba, that whole area has lots of stories about him because supposedly he had a child with the queen of Sheba. Uh, and, uh, there's, there's extra biblical stories like in the, um, uh, Qumran scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have, you know, the Testament of Solomon, which I don't believe is inspired, but it's the story of how God gave him a ring to control the demons and force the demons to do labor to help build the temple. Uh, and it's interesting because when Jesus is casting out a devil, it must have been a popular story I believe there may have been a nugget of truth to it that God may have been the wisest man because he was given wisdom supernaturally by God. It's what uh, God blessed him with that. There may be a nugget of truth about his power over demons or devils, because when Jesus is casting out a devil, they mention Solomon and Jesus said, one greater than Solomon is here. So I think part of that is uh, not only a reference to the throne of David and being a great king, et cetera, but when the context is casting out a devil, 
and Solomon is mentioned, I think uh, it's possible the Lord knew popular first century stories about Solomon controlling devils. And so when he said one greater than Solomon is here, I believe that's a context that we miss uh, because we're not familiar with the first century Jewish mind and what was popular, popularly read by them. I think we missed a lot not understanding that first Enoch was a commonly read book by second temple period Jews. Uh, even Jude quotes from it. So uh, I think we miss a lot of things like that. And if we acquaint ourselves, and I don't misunder, hold on one second. Okay, um, my car lights are on. Uh, oh, I can't even remember what I was gonna say now. Okay, anyway, uh, my car lights are on, I gotta fix it. But there's a lot of fascinating things about Solomon in the Bible. And now, oh, I was saying, I'm not saying that these books are inspired. I'm saying it's good to understand the first century mindset and what was popular in order to maybe get a better understanding and context of, of the people and the times. It's fascinating to study Solomon. All right, uh, let me see. Um, that's uh, any more, Ben, on, on that first question? Well, I, I, just a couple other things, you know, I think, again, um, a couple of parallels where I said before, I think Solomon's career in some respects does reflect the man of sin. But if nothing else, it's just a picture of the law, essentially, because, um, again, in the garden, when Eve, uh, Eve, uh, Eve sinned, she saw that the, the fruit was uh, 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 pleasing to look at and good for wisdom. And that's exactly what the law is. The law looks beautiful and it, it is God's wisdom. But the problem is we're unworthy um, vessels for <laughs> it's unwieldy to us. We can't handle it, um, our flesh. And again, so Solomon was wrote Proverbs, which was wisdom. And he his career was uh, you know there's a lot of beauty, you know, beautiful surrounded himself by beautiful women. The temple he erected a beautiful uh, temple. Um, so again, in the same respect, he kind of is uh, it's a picture. I think a pic picture of the law. Um, but also a picture of, um, uh, you know, a, 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 again, uh, Satan or the man of sin, you know, he, he deceives people. I think that's why the lordship is so, uh, so many people are deceived into it. And same with Hebrew rooters too, is that they see the law, they see that it's, it, it, it's full of wisdom and beauty, and it is. But the problem is, uh, you know, we're, we're not equipped. We can't, we're not equipped to uh, handle it. We, we need... Uh, a, a yielded dependence on Christ. And I think that's exactly what, um, you know, when Satan fell, in fact, in Ezekiel, it says, Ezekiel 28, um, 12, it's a picture of of Satan's fall, I think. Uh, he's, he's likening the king of Tyre, but he's, he's likening him it, it to Satan's fall. He says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord, You were the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And it lists the different stones. Um, but um, uh, so again, it's, it's a picture of the law. And I was going to say something else, but I lost it. Oh, well, it'll come back to me later. But uh, again, oh, oh, I was going to say, so Satan fell. Satan knew all this wisdom. He saw the beauty and wisdom of God. And he was, he, he was, he was the seal of that perfection of beauty and wisdom of God, but he fell, you know? So, and just like uh, Solomon, he had all the wisdom and, and understood the beauty of the law and, and all that, all that was be uh, beautiful about the, 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 the old covenant law. Uh, but yet he fell in a huge way, you know? And so he is, he is a picture of a believer uh, that, that knew all, had all the wisdom of God, perfect, you know, he, he had all the wisdom of God, but he, uh, because he, he lost his, his heart was drawn away from God. He lost that relationship. That se relationship was severed and he fell. Uh, doesn't mean he can't come back. Like you said, Luke, I, I believe Ecclesiastes was his, uh, uh, his returning to the Lord, realizing his folly. You know, so, uh, thankfully God offers that salvation to man, regardless of the degree uh, of sin or how long you've sinned or how frequently you sin. 
but uh, that that same you know that salvation is not offered to the demons or Satan, but it is to us. So I think it's important to keep that distinction. Somebody was mentioning, you know, people use Solomon. There's a book about uh, witchcraft. It, well, they use his name, and I'll say why. It's pro he's probably thinking about. Remember, I was in the occult for for a long time. Uh, there's a book called The Keys of Solomon. And it is a book that some use to summon demons. And the reason they call it the keys of Solomon is it's a lie. They say these are the ancient sim sigils. See, uh, a demon is conjured through a, a sigil. It's a it's an actual something written that represents the demon's name. And it's usually written in some form of blood with an incantation to conjure them. So this book is based on the ancient stories I was telling you about, the Testament of Solomon, that he was given power to summon and then control the demons to help build the temple. So people that do a cult would often use famous names to promote their scrolls or books. If you remember in the New Testament, it talks about how these people, after they saw devils being cast out, uh, that they got scared. They had a fear of God and burned their witchcrafts, their sorcery scrolls, which were worth a ton of money. So what they would do is use famous people's names like Solomon to promote whatever witchcraft book or, uh, um, uh, the, or scroll that they were uh, grimoire, as it were, that they were selling, right? Same thing with false epistles. They had to sort through a lot of ancient scrolls to determine which were inspired and which ones were not. And you'll see a lot of things like the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Thomas. But they were their their opposite or Gnostic teachings, opposite scripture. So we know they're not inspired. But they use famous names like famous apostles so that people will read their work. The same thing happens in the occult. They will use names like Solomon uh, or famous magicians like the uh, Hermes or uh, Simon the Sorcerer. Anything that has fame attached to it in order to promote their writings. I, I wanted to mention that because we were talking about Solomon. And it kind of went along with what we were saying about the Satan worship and stuff. So, well, the Freemasons also uh, honor him greatly, yes. uh, yes. and they the architecture, the architecture yeah. of the temple. Yeah, they're the builders. You know, just like the the, the they're the builders that rejected the the, the cornerstone. Amen. And, uh, their condemnation will be just. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh...